Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. Maybe someday there's going to be a version of the Red Wings where the all-star break isn't such a break for not just the team, but the fans and and us as well. So, Brad, I know you're not a huge fan of of the All Star Game. You're you're happy for the break in general. So, I'd say for now, count your blessings. This is a silver lining for you. It's a season all about moral victories. <laughs> and at this point, rapidly approaching only moral victories. Oh, what am I saying? They keep splitting their games one on one before each podcast. Ever, I think ever since you said that, there have been very few not one in one splits when there's two game sets. You've you've laid a curse on the Red Wings, Evan. It's been at least three or four episodes, so at least a couple of weeks at this point, which is <laughs> it's not how you move up the standings. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's not. But again, uh, I think the the prevailing theme for all of this is everything's as expected for Detroit right now. Some games it's a little more fun. Some games people scream the the sky is falling. It's we're about where we thought the Red Wings would be. Yeah, I think so. All right, folks. Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk to you about all things Detroit Red Wings hockey, the world of the NHL, uh, and everything else in between. I am one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. There's something about saying your name like twice a week out loud on a microphone that I am now like psyching myself out. Like I'm getting the yips before saying my what own. What is my name? <laughs> is that actually my name? And so I, I, I've i carried a different cadence a lot and I'm in my head I'm like, why would I say it like that? That's weird. But now I'm just in my own head. I, I understand how ML, MLB pitchers feel. Like one for one, I have the exact pure empathetic understanding of what they must go through. I, yeah, I, it's essentially the same, yeah. I always say podcasting is a professional baseball of of media types. Yeah, it's recorded, <laughs> edited, you know, you can really just clean up anything you want to say to sound like a genius. Yeah. Um yeah, that we it's do exactly that. the same. I Evan, I promise you there's no amount of editing that can help us <laughs> 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 on this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, besides me uh being firmly on uh uh my you know clown mode just to annoy Brad who is at the end of a, what I assume is a long day. Uh, we are going to be talking about the Red Wings' previous two games, uh, one against the uh, Habs and one, one against the Islanders, where they went one and one uh, We'll be talking about the storylines from those. We'll be taking a look at a little bit of a midseason, how is each player, how's the team overall doing, just to kind of capture where the Red Wings are at while they're on this All-Star break. Uh, we'll get into a, another prospect profile as we start our uh, slow but important trudge towards the 2023 NHL Draft. And uh, if we have time, we'll do some midseason awards, midseason NHL awards. It's been a little while since we've talked about those. And uh, whatever other NHL news comes up before overtime. Before all that, uh, Winged Wheel Podcast Night, or maybe better said, day at the LCA, Saturday, April 8th against the Pittsburgh Penguins. Uh, originally the evening game, if you haven't caught wind of it yet, that was actually moved to uh, 1 p.m. So uh, we are working with our good friends at the Detroit Red Wings on uh, adjusting and enacting our uh, contingency plans for how the festivities will change in terms of timing. So stay tuned for those details as they're finalized. Uh, what Winged Wheel Podcast Night at the LCA is, is a partnered event between us, the podcast, and the Detroit Red Wings, where we host a live show, a live episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast. We've had uh, previous guest stars have been Ken Daniels and Mickey Redman. Prashant Iyer, our good friend of the show, uh, was there at the last one. So uh, there's a lot of good fun. There's a Q&A with not just the host, but the special guest as well. There's meet and greet prizes, giveaways, merch, etc. We have a couple other goodies in, in store for you. Uh, we were chatting about it in the group chat the other day. We're really, really excited. So hopefully it comes through for this one. And uh, in addition to the live show, you also get a ticket to, of course, the Red Wings game where the Red Wings face off against the Pittsburgh, P- Pittsburgh Penguins. Uh, we filled the entire gondola. So that's the same view that uh, Ken and Mick have. So uh, we filled the, the whole top level of the arena. There's upper and lower bowl seats. Uh, we're going to work on adding some more for you as well because the ticket demand has been uh, immense. So if you see tickets you want there, uh, grab them. DetroitRedWings.com slash WWP. You'll notice there's a special Winged Wheel podcast discount on the tickets and a portion of the proceeds benefits the Jamie Daniels Foundation. So again, DetroitRedWings.com slash WWP, Saturday, April 8th, Winged Wheel podcast night slash day at the LCA. Stay tuned for details. I understand that Detroit, you know, is 
working real hard to beat teams like uh, Philly and, or not actually, they didn't even beat Philly, San Jose and Montreal right now. But it is, that game against Montreal was fun. It was fun to watch. Like, no one has delusions of, of grandeur. No one has delusions of, the, you know, this team is now marching towards the playoffs. But that OT win against Montreal was good fun. I think because we all felt like we were the dads, the dads and, and mentors group watching from the stands. Yeah, I think it was more of a sense of relief than anything else. Could you imagine losing to the Montreal Canadiens without Cole Caulfield or Brendan Gallagher this year? Yes, firmly, yes. Yeah. They, they were a bad team before, and they're an awful team now, but the the dads willed them to victory. There's a, Sorry, Mo Sider's dad willed this team to victory. I believe it's pronounced K, K Sider or Kai Sider. Uh, a whole vibe. Just like hand to the ear, just like Mo did. I'm pretty sure he was chirping Habs fans. They were all great. Uh, I can't remember the name that was given to to Jake Wallman's dad, Buffet Glenn or something like that. And like the image of that and then the image of uh, of uh, him laughing last season when Wallman got hit in the nuts with a stick or a puck. <laughs> <laughs> like they, it was just it was just guys being dudes. And it was so funny cutting to them every time in the stands. They had, I'm actually sad for the uh, the Islanders' loss just because they deserved another fun game to go to. But yeah, they were absolutely wi- uh, wilt to victory by <laughs> by the dad's trip. Uh, so the Red Wings opened up scoring Michael Rasmussen. Uh, last episode, we talked about him you know, heating up, having a good game. He continued that, uh, fired at home in the slot. He's been on one. It's amazing what Michael Rasmussen can do on the wing. It is. It's actually like kind of crazy how he's not good at playing center at the NHL level, but he's so much better being a winger. Like it's outrageous. Like Rasmussen's over a course, like a stretch of like a, a chunk of a season. The best result for him at center is he is not noticeable. Like that's just where he's at, and it's not yeah. a knock. But yeah, you're right. The disparity is hilarious. It just goes to show positional value in the NHL. Like when, if you're ever wondering why we we harp so much on getting a center in the draft, or can this guy play center? It's like what Evan said, like night and day difference. Yep. And there's more to come on Rasmussen because his name has popped up um, in trade rumors, maybe unexpectedly for some folks, but we should give that uh, uh, that some attention. So Rasmussen opened up scoring. Um, Montreal tied it two, literally two minutes after, so that trend continued. Uh, Jonathan Berggren scored on the power play. I th- I think I annoyingly assigned every player in office, but he really has made a great case to uh, say that that spot to the right of the net, if you're facing the goalie where he's just there to clean up the rebounds, he's been perfect there. Buried one on the power play. Uh, Larkin and Sider on those assists. Uh, again, it was just a few minutes later when Montreal scored, so that continued. Uh, Sunquist got a tip in front uh, also in the second period. And about five minutes later, Montreal scored again. Um, so the game went into uh, overtime. Actually, you know what? I, before we, we talk about overtime, Vili Husso. Was it a great game for Vili Husso? Not necessarily. Uh, this is a Vili Husso that's been playing way more than I think the Red Wings would have wanted him to coming into this season. Uh, but damn if he didn't make every save he needed to make when it came to crunch time in the third period. And as the buzzer ran out, essentially made a huge stop on the one-timer. That was absolutely unreal. Yeah, uh, those east-west saves off the rush are tough to stop to begin with, let alone when it, correct me if I'm wrong, it was Mike Hoffman shooting it? I think so. Which, yeah, if there's anybody not named Cole Caulfield on Montreal, you don't want taking that (laughs) shot. (laughs) Mike Hoffman's probably the guy. And then he had a a very similar save in overtime off uh, Harvey Pinard in almost the same spot, different circumstance, but because Montreal started that overtime with a power play, so Husso definitely had to have his A game for the Red Wings to even have a chance. And yeah, he had two literal game savers. And in overtime, uh, I think just a phenomenal play overall. Sider with a sneaky good pass, just kind of a hold, shoveled it forward lightly, uh, uh, just kind of caught the defenseman off step to Rasmussen, and Rasmussen made a gorgeous play. Uh, to get it to Fabry in front, who buried it, and the Red Wings won in overtime. So that's another three-assist game for Mo Sider. Uh, that is a Michael Rasmussen on an absolute tear. That's Robbie Fabry getting himself another goal, the OT winner. And uh, 
it's not going to be a game of consequence when it comes to playoff standings. But like you said, Brad, I think it was important to beat a team that the Red Wings should beat. In a season of a lot of lows and many more to come, looking at the Red Wings schedule, you you can't miss these opportunities. A bad team that's very injured. Those have to be W's a hundred out of a hundred times. If you lose to a Ottawa or who's another mediocre team that's not going to make the playoffs but isn't like bad. So if you Florida. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Careful. Yeah. <laughs> but no, if you if you lose to an Ottawa or a team like that, okay, it happens because Detroit's in that tier. It makes perfect sense they would split a lot of those games. But the Chicago's, Arizona's, Montreal's, as they are now, you can't lose those because you're going to get beat up by the playoff teams. You're going to split the games with the near playoff teams at best, so your wins have to come against season. We survived the 1920 Detroit Red Wings, so we know what a season can be like when you're losing to everybody, not just the upper two-thirds of the league. Yeah, it's... I find myself whenever we have a, a longer break between episodes or there isn't a game, I think about, you know, how I reacted to the, the most recent loss, the most recent stretch of bad hockey. And it's just, it always comes back to, you almost need to take a, a dose of your own medicine of what we talked about on the show. Like we said, it's not going to be pretty and it's going to be incremental and, and nonlinear or whatever. And, and I think that's what we're seeing. Not to say no one's allowed to have any gripes because there are gripes for sure. Uh, and that's part of, of being a fan uh, and, and analyzing the games. But yeah, it's... It's as expected. Uh, the Red Wings' next game was the very next night against the New York Islanders. You'd be hard-pressed to find a sleepier game this season. It's funny that I say that right as Evan yawns, which is a risk anytime we're recording. It was totally anytime, planned. Anytime the sun goes down. Uh, but there's almost nothing to say about that game. Uh, I think I was reading in our one group chat that the NHL decided to pick the Red Wings and Islanders for a national primetime game on a Friday night. Yeah. That's what, what, like, that, if you could handpick <laughs> two teams in the NHL this year to absolutely minimize entertainment value, I think these are the two you handpick. Because even with Chicago and Arizona and Montreal's, they're just bad enough that there's going to be chaos because of mistakes. Detroit's defense is just good enough to not be in that bottom tier of the NHL in terms of defense. The Islanders are the stingiest defensive team in the league, and neither team can score. Like, this went exactly how you would expect. When I saw that the game was ESPN, I thought, this is all picked so far in advance. And, it, you know, a lot of times it has anything to do with, like, uh, you know, they have to pick a certain number of, of games on this in this time zone or they haven't done this team in a while or they don't imagine there's going to be a lot of eyes this Friday, so whatever it might be. But, yeah, I looked it up. And I'm like, wow, the ninth and 10th highest scoring teams in the, or the ninth, ninth and 10th lowest scoring teams in the league. Like, that's due to be a barn burner. And uh, the game finished 2 nothing. Islanders. Hellberg played well, lost 2 nothing. That's that. That's the whole game. Yeah, there was probably a, a woo, and that's it. Uh, okay, quickly here, the Vancouver rumors, we're not going to stop talking about them until they don't have any substance to them anymore or something happens. Um, but rather than just rehash what we talked about last episode, something to to note is uh, Michael Rasmussen's name has come up with with regard to what Vancouver might be interested with Detroit obviously having noted interest in Bo Horvat. There could be interest in other players. Uh, Vancouver has talked a lot. Jim Rutherford has talked a lot about wanting NHL-ready players. They don't want to rebuild. They want to retool on the fly. Uh, that sound you heard was Red Wings fans everywhere flinching. Um, but Michael Rasmussen, it's logical in terms of what they're looking for. I mean, handpick a Red Wings player that Jim Rutherford would love on, on Detroit. Rasmussen fits that bill. He could be, this could be a very, I don't know, sell high or... Uh, depending on what you think of Rasmussen and his projection, this could be a situation where Detroit gets quite a bit for him or, or he's part of a bigger deal. So I'll ask you one question and all the listeners, before we give our opinion, answer this question honestly, and then you'll probably have your own answer about what you should do if the opportunity presents itself. Do you think what we have seen this season at different points is the absolute best we are going to see from Michael Rasmussen and Philip Ronick. Absolute 
best from Rasmussen. We, we've seen basically their ceiling. I, I disagree on Rasmussen. I agree on Hronik. Okay, so that's a little cloudy for me. I think we've seen the peak on both. So, yeah, I'm absolutely selling high on both. Do you sell high for Bo Horvat? Because I know you've had questions about whether Bo Horvat's even the right move. <sighs> okay, I got to take the rest of the team building concept out of this. Oh, that's just cheating. Because, but, so if we're saying, yeah, okay, we're getting Bo Horvat and we're getting him at, we'll say, a fairly reasonable. Call it $8 million. Yeah. Extension? Yes, absolutely. 100 out of 100 times. A legit top two center. Again, you can build the team however you want, but the one thing we've been banging this table for is all year, years, decades, don't pass up upgrades. Don't. Bo Horvat is light years ahead better than Michael Rasmussen. Bo Horvat is light years better than Philip Peronik. If they don't trade Michael Rasmussen, I'm happy. I love his progression. I think he's trending to be a really good middle six winger in the NHL, and the Red Wings are going to need really good middle six wingers in the NHL. You know what's better than a middle six winger in the NHL? A top two centerman. Do you know what's better than a second pairing right D in the NHL? A top two centerman. Now, the Red Wings would probably still have to add in this trade, and then you can get into the details of it. But I, I think what we're seeing from right now, what we're seeing from Rasmussen right now is is – the best we're going to see from Michael Rasmussen, and that's fine. He's like 23 years old. It's about the time players start leveling off. I feel like Hronik, we've seen the best of him this year. It might have even been a bit of an aberration. He might not be that. So, yeah. How many players have the Red Wings had over the last five to ten years that were incredible sell-high candidates? And the Red Wings held and just got screwed by it. Mike Green, look at what's happening to Tyler Bertuzzi right now. Capitalize. You have to. You have to. You cannot pass up upgrades. Yeah. You just can't. And I'm not sitting here petitioning to trade either of them. They're both very, very good players. Again, you need middle six wingers. You need second pairing defensemen. They are very good in those roles, but they are not top two centers. Again, we had the conversation of like, if you're acquiring Bo Horvat, what does that mean for the team? And yeah, I'm not acquiring Bo Horvat without a bigger master plan of acquiring other talent as well, because Bo Horvat is not a fix-all, not even close. But I would much rather be looking to fill that winger role and that second D pairing role than a center role. In general, I agree. Um, I think, yeah, you, you as much as I just ribbed you for it, you do have to remove the team building aspect of it and is Bo Horvat uh, objectively the right move? And that's a very real question. I know we've talked a lot based on the reporting and the information that we have, but we haven't done a lot of conversation yet uh, or extensive conversation on is this even the the appropriate move yeah. or the best move for the rebuild? Um, yeah, in general, though, I think this is the kind of thing that uh, that Red Wings fans need to kind of wrap their heads around or, or start to anticipate if this team is going to make significant shifts in who they have you don't get to keep all your players and get new ones unless you win the draft lottery or are a hot destination for elite ufas elite ufas almost never hit market and only one team wins the draft lottery and it is written in the stars that it's never detroit so put that out of your head right now if you want big shifts you need to make you need to take big risks I know like Michael Rasmussen has been a great story. And again, I agree with you, Brad. I would love to see him continue his progression on the Red Wings. I don't think we've seen his, his ceiling. That's where I dis I'll disagree with you. I think there's, if we can, if the team leans a little bit more into him on the wing and, you know, he's playing much better with his size now, there's probably a little bit more to him. But I don't think so much where I'm scared to trade him for a top six center. That's what it boils down to. If If it's a top six center and you believe that it's a top six center that can help your team, you should do it. Contract, term, dollars, all that aside, that is an improvement. All right, very quickly before we, we discuss like a review and uh, grades of where the team is at right now, a note about Bally Sports. Uh, for those who aren't aware, obviously there's Bally Sports Detroit and they're the, the regional network that owns the, the rights to the Red Wings, the Tigers, etc. Um, the company that owns them, uh, Sinclair and, and Diamond Sports Group LLC is, I think, the name I noted down here. Uh, they're going bank bankrupt. They are massively in the red. Um, this is a, a pretty big story in the world of sports business. Uh, they, I think there's a dozen or so regions across uh, uh, America that where they hold the rights to local teams. 
Uh, the Kings, the Red Wings, the Lightning, Stars, Blues, Wild, Predators, Ducks, Hurricanes, Blue Jackets, Panthers, and Coyotes. So quite a bit. Uh, there's This is going to have a ripple effect in a lot of ways uh, in the NHL. Uh, some people have talked about the opportunity of, you know, is the NHL going to try to pick up broadcasting rights? Are individual teams going to try to pick up individual broadcasting rights or just do it all in-house? Is another company going to step in? Um, there are a lot of question marks. Uh, so obviously this is going to be an on, ongoing story as it unfolds. Uh, I think first and foremost, of course, a lot of good friends at Bally Sports Detroit. So uh, we think of them and, and this kind of uh, uncertainty is, is never pleasant. So we hope everything uh, goes well on that front. But uh, something to monitor because it has impacts not just for Detroit, but the NHL as well. Like we're talking about missed payments in a big way for a league that is trying to scrap every dollar that they lost during the pandemic together. And if you're thinking, well, I don't care what millionaires or billionaires make, no, you shouldn't, but uh, it's going to affect the salary cap in the end. TV it, rights are sort of the bloodline of professional sports, TV, so it's a big deal. Yeah, TV rights, gate, like those are the kinds of things that move the needle in a big way. So if you're talking tens of millions or hundreds of millions in, in missed payments or payments less than what you had anticipated on your balance sheet at the start of the year, then you're going to start talking about Mm, is the cap going to go up by as much as we thought? Or Yeah, because everyone always says, oh, there's a, a new media rights deal coming in next year, so the cap's likely to go up or whatever. So this uh, definitely adds a layer of uncertainty, though, to, yeah. to that conversation. Two things, again, like what I said, I hope everyone uh, who works uh, at, at Bally Sports, Bally Sports Detroit, like everyone is taken care of. And, and of course, um, it all goes well on that front. And two, I hope for the consumer that anytime there's a shift, in my mind, I view it as an opportunity to just make this thing simpler. Let us just click one website, log in, watch the game. I don't care where they're playing. I don't care if they're home or away. I don't care what time. I don't care whatever. Let us pay for one thing, watch one thing, no matter where you are in the world. That's all I want. I got five bucks right now. We can start right here. I have 10 in my wallet. Okay, we're at 15. That's 10 more than I usually have in I cash. I probably have some belly button lint too, actually. Oh, that is, it's no good since the pandemic it's started because everyone has belly button. You can heat your home. <laughs> you can heat your home with that if you get enough. <laughs> is your shower dusty? Like, what's going I, on? I don't know. <laughs> that's a that's an over a Patreon exclusive conversation. Yeah. Uh, okay, a quick look at the Red Wings and where they're at. Let's call it mid season. This is what I was talking about earlier when I I said I I sit and think about where the Red Wings are at and. I have to remind myself that we said this is to be expected. 48 games in, Detroit is 21-19-8 with a 521 uh, points percentage. Uh, that is good for about 85 points, which is, you know, as much as it seemed doom and gloom getting here, uh, essentially where we've been at is a, a, a lot more highs at the start of the season, and the lows have kind of brought us back down to, to earth. So the Red Wings sitting at about an 85-point pace mark, you might think they end up a little bit lower based on recent play, but overall thoughts initially on where we're at midseason? <sighs> yeah, that's a tough one. Like, First of all, I can't remember that far back, so <laughs> uh, my six brain cells are working overtime right now. Oh, where'd you get an extra one? You know, I, I borrowed some. You know, I read a couple. Of, I read a couple of paragraphs this week, so well, that's why you were sweating when you walked in today. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, the Red Wings, you know, they started off really hot. There was all the hope and promise that you know bringing these guys in that we raised the floor. This team would be in the battle a lot longer, um, and they'd be playing some meaningful hockey into later into the season, maybe into March. Um, so you know. <laughs> If I look at this season compared to basically all the other ones in recent years, I'd say this one's going a lot better. I mean, there's a lot of key pieces that have been out essentially the entire season, which yeah. totally ruined everything uh, <laughs> in terms of expectation Just or, to put it or, lightly, yeah. or, or hope that this team could maybe make the playoffs. So I think, you know, it's been a little bittersweet, I'd say. Um, so seeing that they're on pace for 85 points, I would say probably better than what I suspected. I think I had them second last in the division uh, in our season preview this year. So um, my logic to get to that point probably was not how it's played out. Um, but, uh, you know, there has been a lot of nice, pleasant surprises. The emergence of Jonathan Bergeron. Sider has kind of broken away from his sophomore slump. Same with Lucas Raymond. 
Um, Larkin continues to do Larkin things. Um, so I think there's been a lot of good this season, you know, just the, the key pillars to this team just kind of evaporated on them with Verana and Bertuzzi. Like they totally expect both those guys to be huge contributors this season and it, it just didn't happen. So it's, there's definitely been some really high points. Uh, there's definitely been a lot of lows, but I think last year we were probably into the, into our eighth prospect profile at this point oh, God. and the fact that we've done one so far as of this moment um speaks volume so um it's really hard to be doom and gloom i know we are a lot but you know <laughs> when you look at the whole season in retrospect like right now it hasn't been all that bad like there's a lot of nice things to look forward to so as evan steps out because um he's been summoned to trial for something in some foreign country um uh, it's on you and I, Brad, to to bring the balance that Evan brings to the show. I agree with Evan overall. I, I in general, the the main points of this season is on balance as expected. Uh, there are a lot of really positive positive things to kind of draw on when you talk about is has this been a success? I think seeing Cider and Raymond go through the paces of of what sophomores go through in the NHL. Uh, and pull their way out of it. Like Sider's been phenomenal. Raymond's been really great since, uh, well, uh, I think 2023, really, he's really kind of found his game again. Uh, that's all good. Larkin has been stellar. That's all great. Uh, you're seeing a Heronic emerge. You're seeing a Rasmussen emerge that we haven't seen before. Fantastic. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again, it cannot be overstated how much the Bertuzzi and Verona situations are an absolute anchor on the outlook of what this season could have been for the Red Wings, both in terms of team performance and team building. And that's where, that's the source of my doom and gloom. Someone messaged me the other day and says, I really think you guys are overdoing how, you know, gray and, and how, you know, sorrowful you are about the out, outlook of this team. And, and we don't try to be anything other than genuine. And I think a, a big source of that doom and gloom for me has been, yeah, the Bertuzzi and Verona situations. Because right now with Bertuzzi, it's yet another case of in all likelihood, unless something changes, another premier potential trade asset for the Red Wings going away, just evaporating to the point where we don't even know if it's a good idea to re-sign this guy long-term because we don't know if he will have seasons like he has in the past. And with Verona, it's a hope and a prayer at this point if he can find his way back on the team. Again, it's not impossible. We've talked about it on previous episodes. There is a path back. Goals have a way of fixing everything. Um, but there's way more to that than just uh, that whole situation than just hockey. And there was a big hockey aspect too because Verona was way off kilter in terms of his game. That's a drag. The Red Wings don't have a guaranteed lottery win. They didn't get Jack Hughes. They, did, they didn't win uh, other lotteries that, that changed things around for them. Yes, obviously they made the most in a big, big, big way with, um, uh, with Cider and Raymond. Of course, you can't have asked for better in terms of where they were drafting uh, than those two. But... Look at the other teams around Detroit. Like, we're talking about Eisenman is interested in Bo Horvat. Yeah, I agree. That's an improvement. We were talking the other day. How good is a Larkin, Bo, Larkin Horvat 1 2 center punch compared to the other teams in the Atlantic? Spoiler uh, they're not at the top. I think at best, best fourth to sixth, depending on how other teams progress. Like, it is going to be exceptionally difficult for Detroit to make the leaps that they can, that they need to make in the coming years. Um, and the Verona and Bertuzzi situations have been just such an anchor on that. So team outlook, that's where, to me, it's still very cloudy. I'm not ready to throw in the towel. There's still so much to come. And, and again, it is all still trending up. Team performance this year, yeah, you remove the the noise. I think this is about where they should be. Yeah, it, it's hard to really get a good feel for where the Red Wings should be right now because of the Bertuzzi and Verona situations. Uh, the biggest gripe we've had with this team is they can't score. This team just has to scratch and claw and punch and kick for every goal. They don't get any easy goals. And, you know, we weren't expecting Verona or Bertuzzi to win the Rocket Richard this year, but if they both played 82 games, I think combined – the floor for them would have should have been 50 goals. Yes. So the Red Wings have lost almost 
50 goals this year because Bertuzzi couldn't stay healthy, and obviously there's the Verona situation. So even though we've been pretty doom and gloom on the season, mostly because lately everything's felt very, honestly, familiar. Like this, this last stretch of hockey over the past, you know, we'll call it six weeks, feels a lot like a lot of stretches of hockey over the last three, four seasons. And my gut reaction is always to go, holy hell, how is that acceptable when this team was expecting to take a huge step forward this year? Not huge, but like at least a very noticeable step forward this year. And they really haven't. Because you sit here and you go, oh, well, they added Kubelik and Perron and Mata and Kopp and Sherratt, although Sherratt's been a drag on the team more than a help, but whatever. If if you just want to focus on forwards, they added Perron, Kopp, Kubelik. This team should have been a lot better and, and been able to manufacture a lot more offense. But the reality of this season is they didn't add Kopp, Kubelik, and Perron. They replaced Bertuzzi and Vrana with Kopp. Kubelik and Pran, and I don't think anybody would have penciled them in for 50 plus goals this year as a trio. Mm-mm. That would have been both best case scenario. So when you factor that in, yeah, this is about where they should be. Now, the big regression in Bertuzzi's game with injuries and everything, and same with Verona, doesn't really piss me off this season. I, like, honestly, it's probably for the best. Because the Red Wings are going to end up with another top 10 pick and they're going to get a much needed piece for the future. I'd rather this team pick eighth overall than have missed the playoffs by one point with the way everything has shaken down this year, which wasn't what I wanted at the beginning of the year. But given the circumstances, it's the best outcome. I agree fully. And I was, I have the same shift in mind and, and Bertuzzi and Verona changed that. Yeah. And, and it, it can't be understated because those were two guys. We were both sitting here at the beginning of the year. These guys could each score 30 plus goals this year. They, Verona scores at that pace. Bertuzzi has scored 30 before, but I think Bertuzzi scored 30 last year. It, it could and should have happened. Oh, well. But what this has also done, losing two top six level players, has amplified our concerns and really highlighted the glaring weakness and the glaring hole this team has going forward. And I know people have, like you mentioned, reached out and said, guys, you guys are, I understand the pessimism, but maybe you're going a little overboard. And there's one key piece of context that I think we've left out of all those conversations. Do I think the Red Wings on the trajectory they are right now without getting a top five pick, without signing a David Pasternak in the offseason, probably without even getting a Bo Horvat? In three to five years, do I see them making the playoffs? Yeah. Yeah. Probably every year. I, I think Larkin's good enough. I expect Marco Casper to be good enough. Edvinson, Sider, Raymond. I expect the core, the young core of this team, to be good enough to have the Red Wings perennially perennially in the playoffs, which we haven't really mentioned. And I, I, I think that is very much in the range of possibility. If you're here and your goal is playoff rounds, get out, because that's not why we're here. I don't, I can I think I can safely speak for you and Evan as well as me when I'm saying when we talk about the future and the goals and the build the team it's for championships not playoffs. I can see this team in the trajectory getting to the playoffs consistently winning a round or two. They are still two to three huge pieces away from winning Stanley Cups. And that is what these conversations are geared towards. Do I think Borhorvac gets us closer? Yeah, of course I do. Does just Bo Horvat get us there? Absolutely the hell not. So this team this team having the slide they have, having the bad luck they have, getting the draft pick they're going to get, it's fine. Nobody should be really that rattled. I mean, after watching the game Friday night, and everybody can attest, <laughs> we're hitting the point in this season where, let, where it's getting close to, okay, please just let it end already, which, again, is a little too familiar to previous years. But when you peel back all the circumstances yeah yeah it's not it <laughs> it the sky isn't falling like it has been in previous seasons the, the hard thing is it's like, no red wings fan is just watching the season going oh man i don't care at all what happens in the future the whole shtick with the red wings the whole point of watching the red wings right now is for the future though 
the whole point of the Red Wings, as long as we've been doing this podcast, which we're getting close to eight years now, over 600 episodes, has been the future of the Red Wings. What is the next version of the Red Wings that we're going to see that's going to compete for cups? Like you said, Brad, I would have been um, thrilled if the Red Wings made a playoff, made the playoffs this year and challenged at least to win the first round. That would have been outstanding for this season. But when we're talking about actual long-term team building, yeah, that's that's the whole, that's the big cloud that's raining on all of the uh, above average to great things that have happened to the Red Wings this season. They've had a lot of negative things happen as well. But um, I think all in all, there are the signs of progress to getting to be a, a team that knows how to win. So we are going to talk infinitely about the rebuild. The trade deadline's coming up in about just over a month, so that's what everything's going to be uh, centered around. So just looking at this season, key performances, I, I want to talk about uh, some individual players. So let's start with who has been the surprise player this season? Who has been a, a surprising player in a positive way? Your, your um, you know, unexpected key asset that the Red Wings have had who has performed better than expected? Couple candidates here, but I, I think even though he's kind of regressed to the mean lately, like how is it not Philip Ronick? I agree, has to be. We we thought for sure like this guy was on a downward trajectory of being a mediocre bottom pair defenseman, and he had that run with Oli Mata of just holy hell, this guy might get some Norris votes level of hockey. Then he got paired with Ben Schrott, and that went in the tank, but. That's a little pessimistic, but if they reunite Hironik and Mata, who seem to be a better fit, yeah, there could be A, a very good long-term piece for the Red Wings, or B, a very good sell-high chip for the Red Wings who are looking to fill other bigger needs on the team. So uh, whichever way you want to look at it, yeah, Hironik's emergence has really, really helped out the Red Wings in the long term. I'll agree that that's my answer, and I think he did enough, even considering what's, uh, his, his, if his game hasn't been outstanding lately. It still has to be a Hironic. Uh, other candidates, though, I, not enough can be said about Jontan Berggren. Not only has he burst onto the scene, made himself a, a, a absolute must-have in the Red Wings lineup, pushing himself further up the lineup, and no one bats an eye because he belongs there. Uh, he's also showing off that he this guy has a potential to be a star in the NHL, and he's showing us how he's going to get there. Like his kind of, I've said it before, cerebral playmaking, his ability to make the proper decision with the puck on his stick, like that is something that the Red Wings lacked before. Um, they really kind of need someone who can drive the play, make the right call, uh, take that extra beat to know who to send the puck to. It's not just about getting scoring. It's about getting the puck to the right place, and, and they don't have too much of that right now. So having Berggren up there on the wing, like we talk a lot about the Red Wings are not set at wing, but relative to center, they're much better off. And, and Berggren has kind of burst on the scene. And for him to do that and make it stick right there, first go in the NHL, not enough can be said about that. Love his game. Credit as well to Michael Rasmussen and what he's done in terms of continuing his progression too. Flip side of things. Hold on, you're not you're not skating past this one without mentioning Jake, Jake Wallman. Wallman. Yeah. Come on now. I actually there's an argument to be made he could be even the second like the runner up for that trophy. You could make the argument he could be the winner of that trophy. Yeah, his I'm almost I almost don't even want to talk about it too much because they need to sign him to a contract. And I, I honestly truly believe like he is you lock him down, uh you lock him down now, give him some term, like that's the risk you take to keep the dollars low or lower. Um but he has been outstanding. How much of that is he's playing with Cider and just Sherratt really wasn't a good fit with Cider and how much of that is Wallman's game? I'm sure there's a little bit of that. Like playing with Cider will generally elevate you, uh, but I've really loved Wallman's game since he, he's had very few bad games or very not so many bad moments defensively, and he's just been outstanding in terms of what he's brought to the defense. Uh, a lot of this is relative, though, and which brings me to the next point disappointing players because it's not just blind optimism here let's be real uh there have been no shortage of disappointing storylines on the season let's exclude jacob verona for obvious reasons uh anyone else fair game who is your most disappointing player on the red wings at this kind of halfway mark i i really really want to say tyler bertuzzi but i'm gonna give tyler the benefit of the doubt when you deal with three separate injuries in a year 
two of them being broken hands. Yeah, it, it would feel wrong to dump on him coming off a 30 goal year. So I'll give him a pass uh, for this award, and then I'm just going to smash the button for uh, Ben Sherrod on this one. He's been bad, and I think because of the contract, a lot of Red Wings fans don't want to... They're trying to justify it. You know what I mean? Like, okay, yeah, but it's a lot of those, sure, he did that bad, but what about this? And it's, you know, he does this very important thing poorly, but this minor thing he's pretty good at. And the more and more I watch it, that's that's Ben Sherratt. Some of the little things that that anyone, especially coaches, can really appreciate Ben Sherratt's very good with. But the, the key major aspects of the game of hockey, he lacks. His hockey IQ is... Bad. I, I'm sorry. I don't have an, another word to describe it. It's just incredibly poor. His defensive positioning isn't good. His gap control off rushes isn't good. His choice for when to be aggressive, when to not be aggressive, when to... It's, it's not there. And the crazy thing is he was advertised as a defensive guy who doesn't bring much offensively. And I really liked his offensive game. <laughs> he is super aggressive in the offensive zone and he makes things happen. And then the second the puck leaves the ozone, he is... a significant net negative to this team he you saw what happened with Mo Sider when he was his pairing then he took they finally finally took him off Mo's pairing and put him with Phil Peronic which immediately put a halt to Philip Peronic's heater I'm sorry that's not that can't fully be a coincidence and then you look at pick any stat any analytic you want Ben Schrott's near the bottom of the league it's it's a, only a four by four contract but He's a guy, and I think it was Dom's model saying that Ben Schrott makes $4 million a year, and he's overpaid by almost $5 million a year. He owes, <laughs> he owes money. He, the, he is, I think, by, what, what's league minimum? Seven fifty. Yeah. So he's overpaid by 4.25. Here's the thing. Watching Ben Schrott is like watching someone sit at the blackjack table and just say, hit me. No matter what, they say, hit me. Or they shove all in on every hand of poker. You're gonna have run goods. You're gonna you're gonna do well, and it's gonna turn out well in a big way. And we see that in key moments with Ben Sherratt, where he jumps in the play, and you're like, oh yeah, like his when the puck is on a stick at the blue line. Evan Evan has said this previously, like that's when he shines, and that's that's why you know he he was sold for so much from Montreal to Florida last trade deadline, and caused this massive market rush of overpaying for defensemen. Uh, I understand that. There's also no doubt, and you can see what he means to the Red Wings locker room. Uh, you know, Perron on offense, Sherrod on defense. Like he, he's brought in for more than just the on ice play. And uh, I, I will always appreciate the physical physical aspect to the game that he brought. The Red Wings got punked on, dummied last year too much. I still think there's too much of that, and and I appreciate having Sherrod for that reason. Cap going up, whatever. The, the Sherrod contract, I can swallow it. But yeah, it, it's just like it's not that. You know, when he picks and chooses, it's it's always bad. He just always it's, it feels like he's just a wild card, always jumping into every possible situation, offensively or defensively, and that's why he's out of position so much. There might be a version uh, of uh, Mo Sider in the future who could have excelled or adapted a little bit more, but Mo Sider, he's still developing, and I I just wanted to see a more measured, uh, I don't know, safe. Ben Sherratt and I I was waiting for it waiting for it and then yeah I came to the same conclusion where I'm like that's just not his game he is always going to jump in on everything and and unfortunately with both Hironic and Sider it's been to the detriment of of those pairings Uh, it's a it's a fair choice I'm going to go one tick further on the scale for me it's Alex Nedeljkovic though in terms of most disappointing player yeah but it's hard for me to to give a significant award, positive or negative, to a backup goalie. No, but he, he was. I, I understand he was expected to come in, and and him and Huso were going to have like a one A one B, right? Yeah, and and it very quickly did not turn into that. Um, so that it, it's totally fair. I just kind of the the significance to the team, the impact on the team, the w- what we're expecting of a player was kind of what pushed me more towards which really killed me too for the record because a player with like a hyper aggressive go 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 attitude 
I deeply respect. I abso- <laughs> it's big Mark Stahl energy. Right? I yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah. love it, but you got he. You just have to pick your spots better, and, and Sherrod doesn't. And Nedeljkovic has that kind of energy in net for better or for worse as well. <laughs> um, so yeah, you were hoping that it would work out, but uh, yeah, it didn't. You know, there was a tweet I, I tried sending a couple weeks ago, but my phone crashed. And I gave up on it, but it was like two minutes or two minutes, 20 seconds into a game. And the first offensive opportunity was a breakaway by Ben Sherratt. And I was like, I just so, I so deeply respect that Mark Stahl energy. <laughs> like, like This defenseman that, yeah, again, was advertised as like a stay at home, like take care of your own team kind of guy <laughs> on a breakaway to start your team's offensive night. I'm like, hell yeah, dude, just rip it. It only would have been made better if he took a clapper from the hash marks. <laughs> what I will say and uh, my qualifier here is that I might be trying to sugarcoat this. I might be trying to see only positivity in the rest of Ben Sherratt's contract. I can still see, all that said, I can still see a version of Ben Sherratt who can be a net positive impact to this team. I just want to see him remove, I'm going to sound like Derek alone here, remove the risk from his game. I want to see him play a safer game, and I want to see him pick his spots better. Because, yeah, he can be effective, especially in the offensive zone. Um, but he doesn't always have to be below the other team's red line. And just focus on the simple positioning that, frankly, his teammates need. Philip Peronik has never excelled in that area. Mo Sider is still very much learning in that area and makes mistakes. They need him to lean on his veteran experience to be better. Can he? That's a question. That's a very big question. But I that would be a version of Ben Schrott who I think could turn this thing around. He's not going to be a first-pairing defenseman, though. That that's He's not a top-four defenseman. No. No, he, he just doesn't have the hockey IQ to be a top four defenseman. He just doesn't. Could he be a, a super effective bottom pair guy? Absolutely. Do you love p- paying a bottom pair guy $4 million? No, Certainly absolutely not. not. No. But you have to maximize him for whatever he is. However, you have to do that. And again, the way he plays, the mindset, oh, I love it. I love it. But y- you have to you have to call your shots better than he's been doing it. And because, like, if you want to look at what Ben Sherratt's best case scenario, he's he's a good in the offensive zone with a big shot who loves to step up for the big hit, but just really struggles with timing and positioning. If Ben Sherratt's best case scenario right now, and I know it's in he's in his thirties and he's not changing, but is Dion Phaneuf realistically? As I know nobody loves to hear that, but <laughs> that's that's a lot of people. I, I that pisses me off, man. You think I'm happy about it? It's a double D on. But they are very, very similar players. So Dion Phaneuf got nominated for a Norris, so there is a recipe here for this to go well. Do I think that's happening in his 30s? No. <laughs> I'm just saying we've we've seen the recipe for it to work before. All right. If we just ignore the the Leaf era. Very quickly. MVP and runner-up. Oh, man. That is... I'll go first. I'm going to say Dylan Larkin has been start to finish good for this team. He's... Yeah. Yeah, it has to be. Even on his off nights, he's still producing. Uh, other players have had peaks that maybe have been a little higher, uh, but they've also had valleys too, and Larkin's been, I think, the only reliable constant. Even with Vili Husso, I think, up there for a lot of the season with him. I think Huso's been overplayed, so he's now, for better or worse, regressed down to the mean. Uh, but it's got to be Larkin for me. Every player that's played with him has been elevated and has at some point excelled. He's carried his line. It's a contract year, of course. He's playing for the biggest you know, payout of his life. Uh, but we've not seen anything other than this from Dylan Larkin, I think, for the past few years. It's got to be Lark's. Larkin's easy one here. The runner-up, I am struggling because I could pick three guys based on like two to four week samples, but looking at the whole season, nobody's really separated. You want to give it to Huso because, well, God, that guy deserves it for what the teams put him through. You want to give it to Hirona because he's the best story. Sider's probably been the best player on the team for the last two to three weeks. You know, Raymond's had a hell of a heater lately, too. He seems to be getting back. I could hear an argument for any of them. Ultimately, I, I despite the very mediocre numbers, I probably settle on Huso just because he's been dealt such a shitty hand this year with having to carry a massive workload, 
in front of a team that is very obviously still rebuilding and not getting a lot of goal support along the way. Uh, someone who I don't think is in the MVP conversation, but if there is a really good, especially considering, you know, age and whatever, uh, wasn't expecting to be this good, David Perron. I think he, he's been as we hoped he would be for the Red Wings, which is hard for unrestricted free agents. Really loved his game this year and what he's brought to the team. Maybe Wallman too. Yeah, Wallman. Did. If Wallman had played 10 more games with Cider, we might be talking yeah. about him as like in that mix of, of guys who you can give, you know, midseason MVP. Anyhow, uh, that is a, a maybe bigger than we should have had uh, overview of uh, the Red Wings at the midseason point. Uh, before we continue on this episode of the Winged Wheel podcast, I want to let you know that this uh, episode is proudly sponsored by NordVPN. Are you missing out on a game or your favorite show because it's not available in your region? Let me introduce NordVPN. Using NordVPN and the click of a button, you can watch and browse as if you're elsewhere in the world, making sure you never miss a game and can watch whatever content you'd like. No need to travel across the continent or oceans for your favorite team when NordVPN brings them right to you. With over 5,000 server options, no game or show is out of your reach. Using our special link, nordvpn.com slash wingedwheel, you can receive a huge discount on NordVPN's cybersecurity two-year plan, plus four free months. We all love to binge, but privacy is a big deal too. NordVPN keeps your information encrypted so you never have to worry about your IP or location getting out. They've also doubled down on keeping you safe with their new threat protection feature. Say goodbye to intrusive website ads and malware. Even if you download an infected file, threat protection kicks in and deletes it before it makes a mess of your computer. Don't forget, there's no risk to you at all with their 30-day money-back guarantee. Give it a try, and if you like it, great. If you don't, they'll issue a refund, and you can pretend the entire thing never even happened. Again, check out our special link, nordvpn.com slash wingedwheel, to get your subscription started today. All right, uh, I think we'll save the midseason awards for next episode when Evan's back. Uh, from being detained on uh, some exotic island. But for now, uh, let's get into our next prospect profile. And this is one we were talking about pre-show, Brad, and, and you noted this might be one that is notable for Red Wings because uh, it could be in the range that we're we're looking at the Red Wings potentially drafting in. So without further ado, uh, Zach Benson of the Winnipeg Ice in the WHL. Yeah, uh, depending on the ranking you look at, he's uh, I've seen him ranked anywhere from 5 to 10, which is right in the range where the Red Wings are Probably going to be picking this year the way things are going and the way the rest of their schedule goes. My, I'll start right off the hop. If the Red Wings are picking in this range, and one reason I would petition for Zach Benson is for the biggest hole we've been talking about the Red Wings having, and that is just high-end talent. Is Zach Benson going to be that in the NHL? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. But he's one of the guys in this range that could be. He has that natural offensive gift that you just can't teach. He's a good, not great skater. Um, when you couple it with his size being only 5'9", a lot of people will look at that as a net negative. But he's an, he's an okay skater. 5'9", uh, can play cent- has played center and wing, probably a winger in the NHL, which, again, who cares what position the Red Wings are picking at right now. They just need to get talent. Um, great playmaker, hyper competitive, just an just hyper hyper competitive. You know, can make plays in traffic, can make plays with space. He's not fast, but he plays fast, and you know we've talked about that at length. Actually, Lucas Raymond's probably a really good comparable here. Plays fast, but isn't fast. That is Zach Benson, and that is his his calling card as a game. He's I think like already got near 70 points in 40 games for Winnipeg in the WHL this year. You know, if everything breaks right for this guy, like you have a a potential Brad Marchand with with less licking and biting and, and, you know, Brad Marchand-y things, but like that type of player, because nobody's going to sit here and ever call Brad Marchand fast, but he's skilled and he's small and he produces, you know, you know, if everything we're we're hoping to break right for Lucas Raymond happens, that could be very similar to Zach Benson, just in that mold of a player. So, you know, there's going to be a lot of good players in this range. This is a very deep top 10 in this draft, so I'm not going to sit here and, and start banging the table for a guy already. But this is definitely a player the Red Wings should be looking very long and very hard at when they step up to the podium. 
So uh, Bob McKenzie's rankings, which aren't, again, uh, as a reminder, aren't Bob's personal rankings, but they are uh, more of a measure of where the league is at, what they're thinking. Um, so th- this is about as good of a window as we can have into other teams scouting and scouting departments and amateur scouting and all that. So he has Zach Benson at five. So that could well be out of Detroit's range. Uh, you know, they could finish 15th last and then win the lottery and then move up to five, but I digress. For me, with Ben Sins, all the things you said, love, love, love the playmaking, great drive. Is he, he's like 5'9", five, 5'10", five, so the size is a question, which also makes me think that even though he's played some center, he'll stick as a wing. That's how he projects. Um, I don't have, I'm not terribly concerned about the skating, like you said, Brad. Uh, you know, we don't watch Lucas Raymond out there and say, oh, this guy can't move. Uh, it's also, this is a complete aside, but I was watching Leon Dreisaitl the other night. I just can't get over how ugly that guy's stride is. It looks like he's struggling every step. Anyhow, it's so bad. It is so bad. I think Zach Benson, it would absolutely bring the high-end talent, the high-end hockey IQ, the kind of uh, uh, playmaking vision, the kind of drive that you need in the offensive zone that would really make a difference on the Red Wings. Uh, I think uh, more can be said as well about his his two way game. Uh, I know he's he's had some PK time, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, would love the pick for Detroit. In and around the guys who might be there, a lot's going to change between now and the draft. But you know, Will Smith, Brandon Yeager, Dalibor Dvorsky. Uh, you could even look at Oliver Moore, and that's not talking about the top three centers of Bedard, Fantilli, and Carlson. It's hard for me. I I know you said just draft whoever, but this is where I split off, and I, I'm thinking. I would love for it to be a problem of whether or not, you know, Marco Casper and X player will be top six centers. I, th- I I really want to see Detroit load up there. You see the impact of a high end center who hits in a big way, uh, who's on their ELC. I would love for Detroit to grab that. So would I be upset with Zach Benson? No, he was, he's one of the better outcomes for Detroit in terms of who they can draft. Um, but I think he would have to, by the time the draft comes around, demonstrate that he's a step ahead of those other centers that I mentioned that aren't Bedard, Fantilli, or Carlson. Nope, don't give a shit. Give me the most talented player there. Do you? So uh, honestly, I am the. Re- I mean, we've got our next eight years of centers uh, wrapped up. We got Larkin, Horvat, Casper. Haven't you heard? We have no more room for centers. Someone. But <laughs> no, again, the Red Wings need game breakers. Like I, I hope, I hope the chorus of people who are like, "Why are you? Why would the Red Wings even get Horvat Casper's coming?" I like, I genuinely hope you're right. But I'm like, I think pinning number one center hopes on Marco Casper is a recipe for a failure. It's a recipe for just putting way too much pressure on a kid. Oh, a thousand percent upgrades, always upgrades. You know what's better than Larkin and Marco Casper? Larkin, Marco Casper, and another really good center. Yeah. Imagine having one of those three at their peak on your third line. You're probably winning a lot of games if that happens. Imagine having one of those on your second line centering Zach Benson. It'd be great. It'd be fantastic. And again, right now we're in a reality where uh, we could be sitting here on July and our only center in that conversation that we have is Marco Casper. But I don't feel like crying tonight, so we're not going to talk about that. You already cried too much pre-show. That's why we had to. We were late recording. Uh, okay, I know it's too early. And I know, we, like you and I, especially, we do a lot of work with our, our profiling, and that's uh, prosper profiling, and that's still early. But in terms of uh, Benson compared to Smith, Jaeger, Dvorsky, Moore, even just those four guys for now, they play a positional premium, assuming they all end up as centers, which isn't a guarantee. Do you think Benson is still the most talented of the group? Yes. Undoubtedly. It's a draft. It's never undoubtedly. <laughs> I know. I'm just trying to pin you. Ryan, for the love of God. I have old takes exposed uh, on a live call right There's now. There's a reality here where Evan gets drafted in the second round and outperforms them all somehow. But can you imagine that's the end of the Evan arc? He just gets, he's like this <laughs> random overage hero, like an e-bug in the NHL. We never see him again. I I could see it. Honestly, I could absolutely see it. But yeah, if we're talking pure talent, I, I think I think Benson's the guy right now. Okay. Out of that group. Benson, intriguing prospect, one to note for Red Wings fans who want to be hopeful but want to stay two feet on the ground uh, and not get too high on cloud nine before the draft lottery. It hey, inevitably hurts everyone. The NHL is still the NHL, and if the Red Wings are hypothetically, say, picking ninth, him being 5'9 ups the chances the Red Wings get him at ninth. Also it's, ups it's the chances th- the Red Wings pass on him. Yeah. 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 Well, they took Lucas Raymond at four, so. Yeah, that was great. That was like... 
not that any of the other drafts weren't, but that was one where you're like, it would kill me to see Raymond slip past, considering, you know, Stutzel went and obviously. The petitioning I did for that guy for a, over a calendar <laughs> year, if he was there and we didn't take him, I would have probably handled it with as much grace and professionalism as I can, but I would have been dying inside. All right. Uh, we are going to jump into the oversi- overtime segment on this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, which is proudly brought to you by our Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash podcast. If you want to sh- support the show, uh, this show only happens because of our patrons. Uh, you get access to the Winged Wheel Podcast Discord. You get automatically entered into all of our giveaways. Uh, we're giving away two tickets to every Detroit Red Wings home game this season. The majority of those going to Patreon supporters. Uh, additionally, uh, you get access to our uh, Patreon exclusive overtime episodes, which uh, post uh, a little bit after the main episode where we answer all the rest of the questions that we couldn't get to on the main show. Uh, it's good fun. We we loosen up. We it, It's a good time. Um, sometimes we talk for like 30 minutes longer than we were planning. Uh, it's like hanging out with us. So if you love us, great. If you hate us, well, maybe not. Anyhow, patreon.com slash winged wheel. Podcast. If you hate us, you should subscribe because then we'll have to read out your hate, your hate comments. That's right. Yeah, it's a win-win. Uh, okay, a uh, question here from uh, Coyote Season Tickets in Tempe. Robert Master Simone has been a point per game player this year after transferring to ASU. I don't hear a lot from the beat writers or prospect analysts regarding his potential future in Detroit. Do you guys think he gets offered an ELC by the Red Wings? I could see it, but he's in his what third, fourth year. In NCAA? Oh, my God. It's been that long. Yeah. So if you're talking about legitimate NHL prospects and he is just now a point-per-game player, that's not an impressive stat line for where he's at. It's not. It, it's good enough that we don't give up hope on him. There, There's still something there, which is good. But, yeah, we're not, you know, knocking down doors to make sure this guy gets through. Uh, this one from... Uh, Clint Benesh says, when the Wings play the Sharks, the announcers were talking about Timo Meyer and their need to move him uh, because to qualify him, it would cost $10 million. But if they traded him, the other team could sign him for less than that. Can you help me out and give me the quick one-on-one on qualifying offers and what they were talking about? Thanks. Love the podcast and how you help further the fans' knowledge of the game. So basically, uh, qualifying offer is a function, uh, an ex- uh, something that the team exercises to to retain the contract rights for a restricted free agent or more popularly referred to as uh, an RFA. So for an order, in order for a team, uh, and I'm, I'm stealing from Puckpedia here because they have it nicely laid out, in order for a team to keep a player's RFA status, they, might, uh, they must provide a qualifying offer. If they do not provide a qualifying offer, the player becomes a UFA or unrestricted free agent. Qualifying offers must be provided to the player uh, by uh, a certain date. And uh, the qualifying offer is based on a, a certain calculation. So... Um, if they make anywhere from seven fifty to a uh, dollar under a million, uh, the qualifying offer is one hundred and five percent of their contract of their most recent salary uh, to a maximum of one million dollars. If they make a million or more and the contract was signed before uh, a certain date, uh, it is a hundred percent of their most recent contract. And if it's a million or million dollars or more and the contract was signed after July twentieth, it is a hundred or the lesser of a hundred percent of their most recent salary or a hundred. Uh, twenty percent of their cap hit. So basically, it's a cal- it's a complicated calculation of actual dollars paid out, cap hit, etc. And sometimes you end up with weird edge cases like Meyer or um, Alex DeBrinket. Yeah, Alex DeBrinket, where they have really high do- dollar values. A player can just choose to accept their qualifying offer. Like that is basically the minimum salary that you have to be. They have to offer them just to retain their or rights. Or one-year contract. So yeah. if this player wants an eight-year contract, they're not accepting the qualifying offer. Yeah. So it, it happens from time to time. Uh, it just it, it needles a team because if they want to offer a player less than their qualifying offer, then the player is just going to take the qualifying offer for more money for that one year. Or uh, they can say, all right, don't qualify me then. If the team doesn't qualify him, then he has a choice to go wherever he wants. So See Kubelik, comma, Dominic. Yes. Um, it's a big, messy thing. It'd be made more fun if um, if Meyer was like absolutely going to be let go on UFA, but I feel like San Jose is going to not just lose the asset. Oh, God, no, no. He's not going to see UFA before whatever his next contract is signed. Um, Joseph Barry says, why do the fans hate Batman so much? Is he that bad of a commissioner? I think next episode we have to talk about the, um, the tanking. Teams don't tank. Comment. Um, it, it's... 
like if you listen to that closely, like we'll get into it. It was brilliant the way he stated it. He's very is that he's was Batman. such a lawyer. He's such a lawyer. He is such a lawyer. Teams don't tank. Our players and coaches respect the integrity of the game. Yes, Gary, the players and coaches do, but I, I feel like you left out a pretty big piece of the equation there, Gary. <laughs> uh, I think, you know what? Gary Bettman represents the owners, and at the end of the day, that's why he's hated. Uh, generally, the owners are there to maximize profit. The part of the game that the fans love are the players and the teams, and you know the players make up the team as far as they know. Uh, the owners have a naturally antagonistic relationship with the players, especially as the uh, NHL business side of things has been me- so messy over the last like twenty five years. And Gary Bettman is pay- paid to be the face of that. I at times am just like Gary, damn it, like. So some things he does, I really disagree with as a fan. And sometimes I begrudgingly, begrudgingly or not have to say, I respect the job he's done. I don't think anyone is wrong in this scenario. I think it's, I, I think it's a fan's hockey God given duty to boo Gary Bettman at the Stanley cup ceremony. But I also, I understand and sometimes even agree with a lot of things that Gary Bettman does that aren't necessarily, necessarily popular. The simplest reason I would say he's as unpopular as he is, you know, you you can needle, like Ryan said, some of the smaller, dumber stuff he's done. And you can understand when the lawyer in him comes out and he you understand he said something dumb like the anti-tanking thing, like teams don't tank. But when you boil it down to why he said that, well, of course he had to. Um, But the big reason he's unpopular, he's the face of three lockouts. Yeah, that's 100%. That's for justified or not, uh, that is, uh, you know, up to your discretion, but he is the face of three lockouts and that will never sit well with hockey fans. Uh, Keenan O'Donoghue says, hey, fellows, if the Wings were to package Perron and Mata in a trade to a contender, what do you think a reasonable return would be? I'm thinking a first round pick in this year's draft plus something else. They would be a great pickup for a team who's serious for the cup. Thanks, guys. Um... I don't know that a first plus. I could see them adding up to a first maybe if a team is desperate enough, Mata turns it on, et cetera, et cetera. Like a cup contender, that pick's going to be like pick 29. Sure, yeah, I I could see teams justifying that. I think if it's not a second plus is probably what you're looking at. Yeah. Because if you trade them individually, are you getting a a straight up a second round pick for either? Probably not. Maybe for Perron. Uh, cause obviously he's played well and he's got a good rep. I don't think despite how well Mod has played, I don't think his reputation has come up that much yet. So yeah, you're on, you're on the fringes of maybe a first round pick. Uh, Wildcat Dallas Drake says, I ordered tickets for winged wheel podcast night slash day at the LCA in April, bringing my 14 year old son and two of his friends on the eight hour drive, uh, from the UP. Uh, that's amazing. We're pumped to see you all. Uh, none of them are big hockey fans, but I'm aiming to change that. Oh, it will change that. <laughs> also, I'm hoping you can help that. Uh, your podcast reinvigorated my love for the sport. Maybe it'll get them going too. A Red Wings win would be good, but I'm keeping my expectations for the post-trade season low. That is wonderful news. Thank you for the support. Thanks for bringing the the, the kids. That's awesome. We'd love to see them there. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can move the needle on them a little bit. If yeah, not, we'll bravo. Maybe that that game could, in theory, be like uh, Bo Horvat's first hat trick as a Red Wing. <laughs> oh my god yeah we're gonna see post trade deadline red wings we might see we might see bo horvat or we might see one of the worst stretches of hockey we've seen in a long time <laughs> uh connor dukes says crazy rule change question you get a penalty shot when illegally stopped while uh, on a clear breakaway why can't we get an artificial two-on-one two forwards at center ice one defender behind the blue line plus the goalie when there's a penalty clearly stopping on a two-on-one I love the chaos of it, which means uh, the NHL will never do it. Uh, but then you get into the gray area of what clearly defines a two-on-one. I'm too much of a traditionalist. Yeah, I, I think that's way too messy. In ter- we we already have a lot of questions on what is a clear-cut breakaway. I want way more penalty shots than we've seen. I think that's too many. I don't know. Yeah, that's too clunky for me. I do like the, I do appreciate the chaos. It's very Mark Stahl of you, but yeah, yeah. Um, all right, let's take uh, a couple other questions here. Lars Thorzell says, "Okay, lads, a development question. As you undoubtedly remember, many of us 
We're a bit worried to put promising players in the Red Wings team because it was just a brutal team with a coach who didn't put too much value in young players. I reckon we've seen a paradigm shift there with the new coach and the emergence of young players who are simply too good to have in the AHL. Now, however, uh, we've, as I see it, uh, landed in another problem. We have players in Grand Rapids that are extremely important to the future of the Red Wings, young players who are stuck playing for a god-awful team who is obviously going nowhere fast. At what point would this become detrimental to the development of Edmondson, Johansson, Soderblom, uh, etc., to play for a team uh, performing as poorly as the Griffins are doing? Is this a coaching issue, or are the older players who make the backbone of the AHL team quite simply not up to par uh, with the rest of the league? As with everything, the answer is probably a bit of both, but then it comes with an, an advantage. The Griffins being an awful AHL team means they can give as much ice time to Johansson, Soderblom, Edvinson as they want, and they don't really have to worry about missing the playoff by one or two points because they decided to lean on a young guy a little too much. They can focus on development. Now, again, the whether or not this team and this coaching staff is even good for player development is a, a very fair debate. But in terms of, like, the performance of the team, I honestly don't think it matters all that much. I'm going to disagree. I think it does matter, and I also think it's important to know that Eisenman does not suffer failure. He does not suffer underperformance. We've seen him go out and make moves specifically to remedy this. Now, again, as we talked about in a previous episode, the Red Wings lost Pat Verbeek to Anaheim. Pat Verbeek did oversee the Grand Rapids Griffins. Uh, Sean Horkoff came in, and he's you know just now had his. He's halfway through his first season of, of overseeing that program. I expect that if this continues or the season, nothing changes over the course of the season, that there will be change. Um, I agree with you, though, Brad, that it's probably a mix of all the things that can contribute to a bad season. I, I Probably the players that they were leaning on to prop up the young guys, uh, probably the young guys maybe not adjusting as well as they would have wanted to naturally in consistency. Uh, coaching is in there. Everything is contributing to this. But, yeah, change does need to come in Grand Rapids. Um, so, like for Grand Rapids fans, of course, that's a great hockey city, but for the Red Wings, especially like you need the Edvinson pick to hit. You need that pick to hit. Casper's coming. And if he doesn't stick in the NHL roster right away, you need him to be playing his way up into to being a top six center in the NHL. Like that team needs to be a great incubator for, for great Red Wings. All right, time for some Reddit questions. Uh, background Junket35 says, which of our prospects do you think is having the best year? Has anyone been particularly surprising? I'll jump on the second part of that. William Willinder. Fantastic year. And we've seen this coming from a little ways away, uh, but I think he's had a fantastic year. He has a great argument for being the Red, Red Wings' best performing prospect this season, uh, if at least up there. Uh, really good story in terms of if you look at picks in the uh, early to middle rounds, you know, you look at someone like Tuomisto and you're like, ah, that's not what you wanted it to be, at least so far. But Willinder has been... I thought really great so far. Yeah, the the Red Wings' best prospect uh, has definitely been uh, the kid in Rogla. Um, <laughs> yep, that one, the one you're thinking of, that's absolutely the one. Um, biggest surprise? Marco Casper is the other Rogla player that Brad's referring to. Uh, yes, there's that one. Yes. Yes. Um, surprise, well, it depends what you define as surprise. Is anybody surprised Carter Mazur's having a great year? No. Are some people surprised he's having this great a year? Yeah, you could you could make that argument. Uh, Shy Booyams having just staying in Denver. It's like two programs are single handedly feeding the Red Wings' future. Um, Shy Booyams had a quietly really good year. Um, so I don't know. Sur- Surprising is a tough one on this, just because. Amadeus Lombardi. That was that. the next one I was going to, yeah. Again, I think we were all expecting a good season, but maybe not this good. Yeah. So th- those are probably my three candidates. Um, Let's Kill Time also asked about Grand Rapids. I just want to acknowledge that. And then I think one additional question there that says, uh, is midseason firing of coaches not allowed in this organization? I just, I, I think for a team that's not in a big rush, Eisman and Horkoff are both going to want to be measured about this and see the season through. Um, it's definitely worth paying attention to, and I wouldn't be surprised if based on performances so far it did happen, but it, there, it, Eisenman just doesn't strike me as the type. Uh, he wouldn't have wanted to fire Blaschel if he couldn't help it. 
Um, particular Waltz 294 says, happy Sunday, gentlemen. I was wondering if Kosa can string together some good performances the rest of the year in Toledo. Could we possibly see him take the starting role in Grand Rapids next year? It's certainly a possibility. Honestly, this, uh, this might be an unpopular opinion and it might be a little too ex- extreme, but he better. He's a first round pick. You look at what other guys drafted in his range at their ages versus where they are now in their progression. If Kos is not there next year, he's already severely behind the the standard set by Wallstedt, Askarov, et cetera, in recent years. So it's if he's not, it's not the end of the world and there's still time to go. But for because don't forget, he was drafted as an overager. He already started a year ahead or behind, however you want to phrase it, of some of the other guys draft goalies drafted in his range, um, you know, between Knight and Askarov, et cetera. He's got to be a full-timer in Grand Rapids at a bare-ass minimum, and whatever journeyman they have with him there, you would hope his talent were, will prevail, but with Grand Rapids the way they are, is that even the best thing for him? It, it's There's so many moving parts right now, and with goalies, so many variables, but if he's not at least challenging for it next year, I, I think the red flags at least are, are starting to appear. I'll say my expectation, like he has to, is that he sticks on the team. If he's playing, you know, a third of the games, then that that's my bare minimum standard. I would like to see him challenge for the starting spot. I think it's certainly a possibility. And, and like Brad said, if you look at the, the traditional path of a goalie that you spent that high of a pick on, yeah, it's not unfair to expect that. Um, in terms of what we've seen from him so far, I think I'm going to set the bar, and this is setting the bar low. It's like it's generous to to Kosa here, but just stick on the Griffins. I, I just sticking on the Griffins. I wouldn't say is could we see it. I think we should see it. Otherwise, yeah, I, you're starting to get pretty concerned about that draft asset. Uh, Kevin K K eighty nine says, "I know it'd be a bad look, but any chance the Wings could move Sharat at the deadline? I feel like even getting a mid round pick for him would be a net positive for the team. In terms of practicality, no, 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 that won't happen. Like Eisman won't do that for a mid round pick. Um, in, in terms of practicality, the teams wouldn't do. That. You probably couldn't give him away at his current contract. Yes and no." Like, yes and no. There's probably one or two old school GMs who who would maybe gamble on it, but... We had not, teams asking about Nick Cronwell at the end of his playing days. Nick Cronwell's worst days are better than Ben Sherrod's best days. I firmly disagree. Like, uh, Nick Cronwell at the end's worst days were not better than Sherrod's best days right now. They were pretty close. They were maybe closer they than were, you'd want to admit. They were pretty close. Ben Sherratt's contract, in reality, is probably unmovable. It's a little bit of an albatross right now. You'd yeah. have to retain. Then again, I mean, the irony here is that this whole flurry of overpayment was set off by overpaying for Ben Sherratt, but we have seen a run of overpayment on defensemen. So if you, if a team needs a third-pair defenseman and we're down to like the last couple of years of Sherratt's contract and the Red Wings have played him in such a way where he's sheltered or at least neutral... You're just Steve Eisman, you get on the phone and say, hey, yeah, I know Ben Schrott's numbers haven't been great, but he plays on these Detroit Red Wings. He'll be much better on your Toronto Maple Leafs, New York Rangers, Colorado Avalanche, whoever. Uh, you, I could see him moving in that scenario. Are you going to see Ben Schrott traded for first-round pick plus like in the past? God, no, 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 no. But that's not what this person was asking, but just for the hypothetical. You're not getting a mid-round pick for him. You're not. You'd have to retain you would have to retain, yeah. You're you're honestly better off just seeing the contract at that point. Well, anyhow, why don't we wrap up this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast? We're going to record our Patreon exclusive. Uh, and also Brad and I get nervous when it's just us in the room and uh, Evan's not here. We, uh, we don't exactly like each other. For legal reasons, that's a joke. Do not radio me on Twitter. <laughs> I am kidding. Brad is my friend. I wish him a Merry Christmas every year. <laughs> And that is and the, a happy birthday occasionally. <laughs> Some years. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> oh, I will never. <laughs> you have no idea. The only thing I look forward to on my birthday every year now <laughs> is I stare at the clock and I wait for it to hit November 5th, just hoping and praying that you don't text me. When have I, I ever your... made it to like 10 a.m.? No, you're always... <laughs> 
And I shouldn't be surprised. That's how your brain works. Like, uh, someone's like, uh, oh, you know, what does Brad know? Like, what's his specialty in hockey? I'm like, he doesn't forget anything. <laughs> he doesn't forget anything, like, at all. And that, like, obviously, you're, I, I think your prospect analysis is outstanding. Um, I trust your opinion more than most other people in the hockey world when it comes to prospects. But it's only amplified by the fact that you don't freaking forget anything ever. It makes me mad. <laughs> As someone who you're especially screwed now because I got three birthdays to remember on the same within oh, a five such, day stretch of yours. It's such bullshit. I've got a I've got direct birthdays now on November first, fourth, and fifth. That makes me so angry, dude. Yeah, so now I get a reminder three days before yours because I've got another birthday. Maybe you just need like a really bad concussion or something. Your best case scenario is like I wake up on one November fourth morning and like. Me and Hank are are sick, shitting and throwing up everywhere. <laughs> I never leave the bathroom. My phone's soaked in like some ungodly fluid in the corner of the room that I don't want to touch. That's yeah. your only. That's your only hope. Which in my house is a very real possibility. Yeah, you're suffering two toddlers or two kids right now. One of them a toddler and a puppy. Yes, how's she doing? Oh, she is great. She is a really, really good puppy. You guys deserved any a, a good. We dog. got we got lucky with her. That's good. When she can meet Abby. When she's got, like, how long? She's, she's, she's been there? around another dog, Abby says already. Oh, good. Oh, yeah, she pissed it right off. No, yeah. Abby's in, um, she loves other dogs. She will play, but she's very much has grumpy old lady energy where she, like, will play. But when she wants to stop, she's like, hey, I'm relaxing right now. F off. Yeah, they, uh, it was my sister-in-law's dog, and he's got grumpy old dog, old man attitude, too. And, yeah, he, he had enough of rocks after, like, 40 seconds. Just like, all right, that was fun. You can go away now. Um, and then, uh, of course, Rox didn't. No. <laughs> so she got a, couple, got a couple warning shots. Yes. All right. Uh, we're going to bring this over to the Patreon exclusive. Folks, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, again, the midseason awards, that discussion will come in the future uh, or in a future episode. We have some uh, good interviews coming up. We hope you enjoyed the last episode's interview with Elmer Soderblom. Uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors, NordVPN, who have been great to work with. All of our listeners, new and old our name level supporters on Patreon. Our good friend Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation, all the way out in Luxembourg. Ache for armchair GM slash genius, Nick Perks, Terry Driver, the number 69 cry, and Ryan Hannes, but in a slam of Jamathong, Glenn Brabham, Aiden White, Matthew M. Rice, Croner's Left Knee, bonus content on Patreon, uh, Carl Brutana Nanaluski, Chimmy, Chris P., Citizen High Five, Connor Scovey, Coyote Season Tickets in Tempe, Denny's Gamer Girl, Derek Enstam, DJ Denton, Give Blood, Fight Probert, Red Hot Ronick, Hassam Al Kassem, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Joel Miranda, who's a brand new name level sponsor. Joel, thank you so much and welcome to the Dub Dub Club. Joseph Barry, Kaylin Wood, Kevin James, King Tone, Las Ensaladas Picantes, Marcus, Massive, <laughs> Massive Wong, Evan Long Saber. <laughs> yeah, that's a reference to the last blooper reel. Matt McKay, Michael Edlin, Nadelkovich, goalie number one, Nicholas Fritz, R.A., Ryan Hubbard, Scott Martin, Send It Seawolf, That's What I Appreciates About You, Venom, Zachary Rogers, General Andy Bohan of the Cheesebag Army, Sam Bankson, number one Detroit Red Guys fan, Antonio Gracias, Babe Landeskog, Ben Barron, proud member of the Jake Wilm and Gritty Club, Brad Simmons, Brian Vasha, Carl Thames, Connor Layton, and Darren Fick, Philip Zadiz Nuts, Grand Rapids, Hockey Guy, Griffey Boy, Heronix Handlebar, I can't tell if this next name is dirty or not. James Laporte, <laughs> Reed, <laughs> damn it. Uh, Jeremiah Dobo, J.M. Rhapsody, John Evans, John Ingalls, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Lieutenant Matt S. of the Cheesebag Army, Linda Hull, Maximilian, Melissa Erickson, Ricky Bong Rips, Servo, and uh, Steven, brand new name level sponsor, and the Hodag. Oh, sorry. And, my, and finally, my favorite patron, Matt Keeler. Clever, Matt. All right. Thank you all so much. Take care. And we will catch you on Wednesday. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.